Szép jó napot! Az én nevem Csorba Miklós, én volnék a házigazda a World Conservation Forum színpadán a mai napon. Magyar és angol nyelvű előadásokat, beszélgetéseket lehet követni, és ezáltal gazdagítani a tudásunkat fenntarthatóság szempontjából. Most egy angol nyelvű előadás következik majd, elkirándulhatunk majd Afrika déli részére, ahol a fenntartható vadgazdálkodás rejtelmeiről tudunk majd meg többet. Úgyhogy azok, akik angolul értenek, ők előnyben vannak a téma kapcsán, akik nem azoknak kellemes pihenést kívánok. Now let me switch to English, because uh, uh, our next guests and our next presentation will be an English speaking presentation. Uh, sustainable use of wildlife in southern Africa. Our next guests are Futo Magwanya, Director General of Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority, and Patience Gandiwa. She's the, the, the Director of International Conservation Affairs also in Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority. Enjoy, and uh, right after, you can address some questions if you would like to. It's a good afternoon to you all. First, for you to understand the issue of sustainable use of wildlife resources in Southern Africa, we are going to give you a synopsis of sustainable wildlife conservation in the 21st century. In that context, I think it becomes more palatable. And when we say 21st century, we want to make sure that it's well understood and it's well captured by the younger generation that we see attending this uh, event. So in terms of the outline of the presentation that you give, uh, we'll give you uh, conservation with reference to the SADAC transfrontier conservation areas so that you can appreciate why is it important that we are pursuing wildlife conservation endeavors in Southern Africa with particular reference to the Transfrontier Conservation Areas Program. We'll have a bit of highlights on the dilemma that we are facing in this uh, generation, looking at realities of our time and dynamics, and then have a bit of uh, appreciation on the framework of wildlife conservation and utilization thereof, and then a little bit dive deep into the complexities of conservation, looking at issues of culture science and the economics of sustainable use of wildlife. And my colleague uh, with me here will dive a little bit deeper into the case study of Zimbabwe, looking at the role of wildlife conservation and sustainable utilization of resources in Zimbabwe. Therefore, it's very important uh, that we understand and appreciate what sustainability is. So sustainable wildlife management, according to the CBD, which is the Convention on Biological Diversity, is the sound management of wildlife species to sustain their populations and habitat over time, considering the socioeconomic imperatives, including human beings uh, in the nexus. Sustainable wildlife management it doesn't preclude sustainable use and also hunting. And Southern Africa subscribed to the principle of sustainable utilization of wildlife resources as espoused in various protocols, like the SADAC um, Protocol on Wildlife Conservation and Law Enforcement of 1999. And we believe in Southern Africa that conservation makes more sense and is more sustainable when it is pursued beyond boundaries. And for you to appreciate a little bit more what is it that we mean, what are the complexities, what are the realities that we are facing in Southern Africa, I think the story of the SADAC TFCA program, it gives a little bit more insights. And SADAC member states, they recognize the importance of improved stewardship of such resources, and because wildlife it's a fugitive resource that goes across boundaries. There is, it, it makes more sustainability, it, it makes more sustainable use sense when we are working together, and this is what we are doing in Southern Africa. So I'll give you a short uh, film for you to enjoy. It's an open source, and you can always watch it. The Southern African Development Community, or SADAC, was born of a vision to ensure economic well-being, improvement in the standards of living and quality of life for the peoples of Southern Africa. 
Sadak comprises 15 member states and is a region abounding in natural and cultural wealth. The vast and breathtaking landscapes are studded with countless treasures. However, wildlife, as well as rivers and even culture, do not neatly follow the arbitrary lines on a map that make up national boundaries. The movement of these resources is essential for maintaining population health, viability and resilience to change in the long term. These landscapes are essential to the continued provision of fundamental ecosystem services upon which we, as human race, rely. This is especially true in a world where our footprint as humans is continuing to dissect biological habitats and erode the natural resource base. Consequently, these resources cannot be considered only national assets, but regional and global assets for which the duty of responsibility must be shared. In stark contrast to the rich biodiversity that these nodes offer, they often characterize high levels of poverty amongst the human populations that host these resources, as they bear the highest opportunity cost of being their direct custodians. A combination of factors lock these populations in a tight cycle of poverty, including limited rights to use the resource base, meager livelihood options, inadequate service provision or access to services, and high levels of human-wildlife conflict. The resources upon which these populations rely so heavily are often not managed in a coherent manner by the corresponding agencies across international borders. And this has serious implications not only for the resource in question, but also on whom human livelihoods. Defined in the SADAC Protocol on Wildlife Conservation and Law Enforcement of 1999 as the area or component of a large ecological region that straddles the boundaries of two or more countries, encompassing one or more protected areas as well as multiple resource use areas. Transfrontier conservation areas or peace parks differ substantially in spatial parameters and the mix of land use categories. Those adjoining protected areas are referred to as transfrontier parks. Those that encompass an area of multiple resource use areas are referred to as transfrontier conservation areas or TFCAs. Currently, there are 18 existing and potential TFCAs in SADA in both terrestrial and marine environments at different stages of development. While there is no international convention for TFCAs, these initiatives complement the goals and objectives of a series of international conservation-related conventions. And IUCN has identified over 227 transboundary protected areas worldwide. TFCAs offer a platform for dialogue between... It's always annoying sometimes when there's something interesting going on and someone interjects. But this is just to give you a snapshot or highlights of why we do conservation and why it matters to do it at the scale that is appropriate and essential for the resources that we manage. Because some of the species that we have to manage, they roam across big and huge um, warm ranges and across boundaries. And Zimbabwe is, of course, pursuing siege six of such uh, initiatives. And the main point I want to drive home is that conservation initiatives in this generation, they should be, and it makes sense if they are pursued beyond boundaries of protected areas. And we need to secure more space for wildlife to roam and supporting more compatible land use options. And one such endeavor or one such initiative that we've done, which has occupied that space and made conservation outside protected areas makes sense is through hunting and sustainable use. However, we do have a, a challenge, in fact, challenges, and it's a dilemma. The realities of the 21st century are dictating that it's not business as usual, and things cannot be done business as usual. 
The International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services published a report in 2019 telling us the reality that we are losing more species at a rate faster than ever before. We are losing habitat for wildlife. They're continuously being fragmented. We are actually losing even more, even more species, and there's a challenge of climate change. Maybe some of you might have seen uh, this uh, short film on uh, called The Inconvenient Truth. If you haven't done it, I advise you to watch it. It will just help you appreciate a little bit more about what climate change is and what are the implications that we have. We are having more and more issues that are questioning and also advocating for the role of lo local people in all this. But of course, I think one of the issues which also um, touches the attention of uh, the hunting community is the issue of Sisu the lion. And I think this really made, made global shockwaves across the entire world that there's an iconic species that has been shot by a hunter, and there were all sorts of names that were, that were mentioned about. And as governments that are managing these resources, we have to introspect and also check, was it an illegal hunt? No. The hunt of Cecil the Lion was perfectly legal. Everything was done above board. There might have been some irregularities here and there, but this doesn't make it an, Ill an illegal hunt. And there was so much campaigns and also even uh, calls for extradition that we, we done. And, and even the, the campaigns through the media, it, it continues. And it has even sparked some considerations in various um, states to consider even new laws and to look at hunting and, co and sustainable utilization of these resources. I, I, with a, from, a mo, from a much more uh, critical perspective. And more recently, there was also the, even the issue of Mopane, the lion, um, and, and it's really making some media shockwaves. But we, we really need to then check and introspect to see why is the problem? Uh, what is it that we need to do? Is there anything that we need to do? Is there anything that is missing? And we know that at a global level, at a regional level, and even at national level, we do have the various tools, laws, protocols, guidelines, uh, codes of conduct, ethics, all the way down to the right scale to make sure that sustainable utilization of wildlife resources is compliant to those various legal statutes and instruments and we know that there are various pu uh, published guidelines through IUCN, and even there's, there's also adaptation at national level in terms of what it means when a species has been listed in Appendix 1 of CMS, for example. The International Convention on Trade in Endangered Species of World Flora and Fauna CITES, and also even the red list that continues to be populated and to, to grow long. So where is the missing link? Why are we having so much polarized views with regards to sustainable use? Why are we having so much polarized views with regards to hunting of iconic species? And what is it that we need to do? There's more and more advocacy around animal rights, but so is also the advocacy for human rights. And we do have obligations to perform and responsibilities that we have to embrace. Nobody has the answer, but there's so much at our disposal to use and to guide us through to make sure that the utilization of wildlife should remain sustainable. There are safeguards and there are limits of acceptable use that have to be observed to make sure that the utilization of wildlife remains sustainable. And member states, that are practicing sustainable use principles, they have to make sure that all this is observed and it's implemented. And we also, there's also another dynamic that comes into play, which is the issue of the culture. We know that hunting is a culture. It's a cultural heritage. Humanity have been hunting since time immemorial. We know that we have to make sure and put measures, programs and mechanisms in place to ensure that the revenue that is 
generated through sustainable use of wildlife resources also accrues to be plowed back into conservation and local communities are benefiting. However, when we dissect this whole issue collaboratively and in have insights or, or look at the current trends of populations, habitats, and also the projections from a climate change perspective, and even the emerging value systems that animals are being given names, they actually even sometimes having midnight prayer vigils when there's a, a wounded animal, etc. You see beanie babies being created and being sold like hotcakes. All these, I think, they are emerging trends in terms of how humanity and in different parts of the world look at wildlife and appreciate these resources. And we need to be sensitive also and, and they look at the issue uh, from both sides of the coin. But the most important issue that we need to do is to make sure that we strategize collaboratively together to address these key perceptions which may not always be objective reality. Therefore, sustainable utilization of wildlife resources in the 21st century requires us to have a true boss of, of options, an innovative mindset, and also transformation so that we appreciate these issues from very, through different lenses and not to, not to hold a hammer in our hands as if it's our only tool, and then we want to, have to treat everything as a nail. We need different tools which suit different geographic locations and different situations over time. Therefore, a multi-scale and a multifaceted approach is not only important, but it is a necessity. And this is just maybe, this is time to reflect in terms of how we can address the polarized views on sustainable use issues and the challenges that we are facing in present day. Are there things that we are, right things that we are doing wrong? Are there wrong things that we are doing right? Are there things that we don't necessarily have to change? Or are there right things that we are actually doing right? If it's not broken, why fix it? If it's working in one part of the world, sustainable use principles, why try to fix it because all geographic landscapes and eco-socio-ecological systems cannot be the same. But it's also important that even the hunting community and even countries and individuals that believe strongly in this principle, they should also smell the coffee and be able to differentiate perceptions versus objective reality, differentiate between culture and morality, science versus emotion. We've seen in this global uh, meetings and policy uh, fora that most of the decisions are also increasingly being made through emotion, not necessarily science. And we have to make sure that the local community views are also matched with uh, the not only over, overshadowed by global community voices and understanding the complexity that we are facing today. Therefore, we have to invest in generating knowledge through research so that our policy and practices can actually be seen to be talking to each other. So just a few reflection points. We need to secure the core areas because this is where wildlife comes from. We need to scale up and strengthen other area-based conservation measures, such so as TFCAs and community-based initiatives. We need to invest in Africa's natural capital. We need to prioritize science and take note of the thresholds of potential concern. When it's no longer sustainable, we should know when to stop. When it's sustainable and it's working, we should be able to accept it. And we need to give local communities a chance to lead, not only to be subjects of benefit, to say how are local communities benefiting now. We need to tap more on the local ecological knowledge and to make communities lead these initiatives which affect them. Therefore, wildlife conservation in the 21st century requires pragmatism, inclusivity, sustainable financing mechanism was to embrace diversity of approaches that are working in different parts of the world. So there's no one size fits all approach and we need more robust and resilient wildlife economy and a balance of both consumptive and non-consumptive tourism model. 
In this century, there's a lot that has been happening positively and also the negative. And there are blueprints that are already there. It's up to us to shape our destiny and even contribute to the draft global biodiversity, um, the global biodiversity framework. And Africa, some of you might be aware, is hosting the inaugural Af Protected Area Congress for Africa. It has never been happened. It has never been hosted in Africa. Uh, before and I think it would be such a good platform to reflect on these issues and there are a lot of uh, conventions and conferences and meetings that have happened already including even the um, Africa's Wildlife uh, Summit which was hosted by Zimbabwe and Victoria Falls that giving us platforms to reflect on these issues and make sure that we pull together and confront the challenges of today and produce workable and sustainable models that can sustain even the principles of sustainable utilization of the resources that we care so much that we all seek to conserve and protect. I will invite on stage my colleague, um, Dr. Fulton Mangwanya, who is the Director General for Zimparks, to give us you a little bit more insights of wildlife conservation in Zimbabwe and the role that sustainable use has been playing uh, in Zimbabwe's wildlife um, uh, economy. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Fulton. Thank you, Professor Patience. Right. Um, my name is Fulton Mangwanya, as you can see there. I'm going to touch on the role of sustainable utilization of wildlife resources in Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe has got uh, a biodiversity which is so diverse. We are talking of 530 vascular plant species, of which 214 are endemic. 630 bird species, 270 mammal species, 256 non reptile species, 120 amphibian species, and 151 fish species. We are also proud, ladies and gentlemen, to state that we have got the largest, the second largest population of a problem worldwide, a problem in the form of an elephant. We have got the, largest, the second largest population, and as well as the fourth largest rhino population in the world. In terms of uh, uh, charismatic large uh, canvas and uh, several angles, we have got a stable and growing population. On the map, as you can see, it's actually showing Sadak. The green one is Zimbabwe. How are we implementing sustainable use? Sustainable utilization of wildlife resources involved quota setting informed by science. Whatever we do is informed by science. We do our assessments for us to come up with a quota, which is also approved, and it involves all stakeholders is not done by the authority only. So it's one thing that needs to be taken uh, into consideration that whatever we are doing is all inclusive and highly scientific. Consistent inventory of wildlife resources and continuous monitoring programs are necessary. We have got over 2,000 rangers who are always on the ground monitoring the state of our wildlife as well as doing all this uh, counting and what have you to make sure that they talk of a resource that they are quite sure about. We protect what we know, so we are always on the ground to make sure that we take stock of what we have. Sustainable utilization principles so are based in science. There is no way we actually do some of these things in a haphazard manner. So what do we need to do? We need responsible journalism, ladies and gentlemen. There are a lot of issues, there are stories that actually come in the press about the way we are doing business in, in wildlife conservation, like in Zimbabwe, which are false. People who have got their own agenda, nefarious activities to justify uh, you know, this consumptive uh, uh, tourism that we have in Zimbabwe. But we are doing these things right, and someone has got to listen to the other side. You know, the audio out from bottom principle has got to be respected. The other side should be heard, not to listen to one side of uh, these stories that we get. Also, we have to debunk the myths against hunting. You know, some people will tell you that hunting is illegal. How can it be illegal, yet it is actually controlled by regulations and laws that have been framed by 
an authority which is reports to the government. All we are doing is legal, but some people feel otherwise because they are so in love with wildlife and they feel wildlife is more important than human beings. We had an issue that the patient was talking of, Cecil the lion. Honestly, a lion can live in the forest, in the wild, for up to about 13 years. Cecil was almost there, 13 years. In any case, he was going to die. How was Cecil uh, brought up? A lot of resources were used. I'm talking of over 2,000 rangers who actually look after these animals. They were looking after this Cecil up to the stage when it gets to 13. Looking after Cecil up to, to, to enable the scientists to do the research which they were doing and they ended up naming the, the, the lion Cecil. In our culture, we don't give names to wildlife, but they did it for the sake of research, but it was abused later because Cecil was not shot in the protected area in the National Park. He was outside the National Park. What was he doing there? And again, we've got a story about Jericho and the uh, topical one, Mopan. You know, all these stories are false. The real truth has got to be actually asked for from the authority. You can, you can, you can explain better. We expect our reporters to be reporting of uh, the statistics and value chain. How many people actually came into our hunting, tourism, what, how much was uh, received, how much did the communities benefit, what have they done with the money, such reports would actually uh, do better for us because, you know, we have got a growing and diversifying economy. Hunting cannot pay for everything. Yes, it is true. When you talk of our case as an authority, we only get 10% from hunting. Neither can we say photographic tourism can pay for everything. We have got various revenue streams that come in to aid in wildlife conservation, which is a very expensive venture. So some of these things need to be explained in their proper uh, context so that you understand where we are coming from. We need a global movement for sustainable use because as it stands right now, we have got see, a lot of uh, people who are actually trying to attack this. So there is need for us to come up with also this group to fight those who are anti-sustainable so that the truth is understood well by the world. As you can see here, we actually do the, uh, the, 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 the monitoring and recordings of ages of trophies as well as the offtakes over time. If you look at uh, 2013, we had about 31 uh, lions which are hunted, and in 2018, we had about 33. Uh, since the inception of the points allocation system in Zimbabwe, that's 2017 and 2018 were the most successful years in terms of offtake of lions aged five years and, or older, with 85% of 100 lions being five years of age or older in both 2017 and 2018. If a meander actually shoots anything below this age limit, there is a punishment which is associated with touching act. So we have tried by all means to come up with rules and regulations that make sure that whatever is do, done is ethical. The tools and approaches used as continuous improved to ensure effectiveness and where data is deficient, the precautional principle is always adopted. We, look, we have got the same way we are talking of uh, uh, elephants. Zimbabwe's elephant population has been increasing and uh, the figures that we have here are uh, as at 2014 where we, when we had our last census of uh, these uh, elephants. And uh, approximately 91% of the Zimbabwe's elephant population occurs within the, the, the parks and wildlife estate with a fluctuating population of approximately 6% occurring in the communal land areas without sustainable use, the land usage you outside protected area could be converted to an alternative land use. Wildlife habitat outside protected areas is important. Zimbabwe secures an area as big as protected area state in campfire area that benefits the hunting. Uh, we, are, we are actually talking of 13% of Zimbabwe, which is under protected area, and another 13%, which is outside protected area. So in total, we have got over 10 million hectares, which is 28% of Zimbabwe, which is reserved for wildlife conservation. 
on the map there, if the red ones are the national parks and uh, the yellow ones are the safari areas where hunting is done, a recent uh, cabinet decision to remodel campfire to facilitate more decentralization and scaling up benefits for local communities through devolution and diversification shows a huge commitment that we have to our communities. But however, it's a pity that uh, the same, the same notion or the, the, our view is not respected when it comes to CITES. The same communities are not allowed to actually participate as warm bodies at CITES, but the non-governmental organizations are allowed to do the same. We have under campfire over 800,000 families who are benefiting from uh, campfire and about 55 districts in the country which are benefiting from campfire. These should be respected and they should be allowed to represent themselves at international forums when we talk of uh, wildlife. Because they are the same people who are looking after the animals. They are the same people who are actually getting the brand when it comes to human wildlife conflict. Two days ago, someone was killed by an elephant. All these things are things that need to be considered. But one person thinks elephant or lion life is more important than that of human beings. Wildlife conservation is about partnerships for a common vision. Here we've got a strategy as an authority which shows key targets that we have, and it also shows desired future, what we want to achieve. Also on the, underneath it shows how we are going to achieve same in harmony with nature. We welcome all who want to work with us in conservation because Zimbabwe aspires to be world leader in sustainable conservation. Ladies and gentlemen, wildlife conservation in video form in Zimbabwe. Yes, that's photographic and consumptive tourism in Zimbabwe. We need more resilient conservation models and appreciating issues through different lenses for us to really understand what is on the ground. Otherwise, thank you very much. That's all we had for you from Zimbabwe. <laughs>